Okay. How far did you get get last? Oh. One? I should have I should have asked you. We got right to the end. <laughs> I didn't get I that very it. far, but I, I have it marked. Hi, Larry. I I had it okay. Um, Exodus twenty-five seventeen. Oh, I, okay. I thought you'd be a. So you took your time going through well, it. Well, let me I, tell you, we took about an hour and a half on three sentences it, it was wonderful because i didn't have to do much oh so what did you discuss well that was a lifetime ago yeah it was a week ago uh, <laughs> so so what did you what what specific uh discussion did you have those three as you said um what were we discussing? I know we had discussed the acacia wood. Yeah. And why that was used. Okay, we also discussed the three levels um, of people who had access. You know, there was uh, Moses and then. Um, and no um okay so the people were on one level in the, and uh who? levi yes i'm okay. glad somebody remembered because well that was good that was that it must have been fun. fun so what was your conclusion this was going up the mountain right you had the people all the way at the base of the mountain and then above them you had the elders and the the priest no. this is just building the uh the ark okay yeah and yeah one question that we discuss at large and since it's my favorite i'm going to mention uh is uh it says and god build me a temple or build me a holy place and i'm going to dwell either among you within you so that's yes. yeah so it was the question yeah a big one, a big one. It, that's a very important uh, discussion uh did you did you talk about uh that you, you carry god within you in your heart good yeah good. yeah yeah. And Larry, that yeah. that's what I was addressing before about how the temple is constructed. Right. Uh, because if you th if you now overlay the human body with the construction of the temple, you'll see that the you can look at it one of uh, a few ways that the uh, the uh, Mishkan itself is is uh the heart of of the uh of, of the entire temple which is very interesting we also discussed would correspond to the chest yes yeah we also discussed the idea that the original temple was designed to be portable yes because very god wants important. to live inside all of us and, yes um, we, we had a good discussion about the good. portability of the temple Okay. I, have, I, have, I have one trouble making that you say, um, David, it, when you say portable, what comes to my mind is it, it should be portable for us as well. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Rabbi Mary. That's um, right. We'll, we'll I, I, I have one trouble story. making question too, and that was uh, where, where in the text did it give um, us permission? To stop obeying the commandments and to and to soften them and, and make it more convenient for us. Where where does right. God have permission? And okay, yes. and what was the conclusion of that discussion? I, I didn't hear one. Okay, I don't think we. I yeah. don't it was think a there good is. Question. Yeah, don't ask a very good question, and we need yeah. to think about is uh, when we modernize 
or change the rules as written, where does it say that we should do that? Am I right, Don? Yeah, that was my question. Where do yeah. where where because it's not like um, Larry mentioned our constitution of the US, but that has provision for for altering or making amendments. But what I was looking for in the text in the Bible was where is that equivalent that gives us permission as humans to modify God's commandments? Very interesting <laughs> question. You know, over time, over time, probably, be, and I'm just going to say this off the top of my head, uh, over time, depending on the circumstances within which the people were living, some of these rules may have had to be bent and some stopped out of necessity. Uh, it, you would like it to be continuous and for all time, but it would be very difficult given different circumstances. Uh, you know, I can think of, of uh, if, if I had lived at the time of the diaspora, there are a lot of changes in custom that I would have had to adapt to. But, but God would know that. He was, wouldn't he say, look, looking ahead, you're going to have circumstances that you're going to have a hard time dealing with. So, so you get you get your priests and rabbis together and and you can uh, make changes as necessary. But that he didn't say that. We will get to a phrase a phrase in a, it, it, in a bit. It'll be a couple of uh, not a couple of months, it'll probably be within the next six months. Uh, <laughs> uh, building a wall around the uh, the Torah or the sanctuary. Uh, to guard it, okay? And again, now somebody else may have thought of this before, I just do not know, but what I, what I see is it's like the, our skull. Build a wall around your, your, your mind, your brain, your mind, so that you can guard, uh, this, you know, uh, the influences from the outside into your own thinking uh, so that you can maintain the uh, the core of the religion you can but it, it it's asking an awful lot but we're supposed to be a nation of priests so that is an awful lot and so but for the, for for most people that I think would be a daunting task. That would be a very daunting task. Depends where you live at the time. Depends on the culture that you're living within and the different influences. And it's very hard to do that. And I don't know if this is a warning against assimilation. I do not know. Okay, when you say a wall, is it to keep ideas and people from the outside getting in, or from, you know, as you said, keeping um, the whole group and preventing escape. And there's also the concept of the fence around the Torah. Yes. Not, yes. Yeah, which is totally different. And so we will explore this. You're very correct, Larry. There are different ways of looking at a wall. But I think that I think that uh, this discussion, we can continue, keep it in mind, because it's going to come up again. And I think it's very important to explore that, too. Yes, uh, Michael, and then Don. Yeah, when you say the core of the religion, what do you mean? Okay. Well, when I use the term core, I mean the heart of the religion. Okay, and that is, or the soul of the religion, and uh, you want to protect that the the best you can. In a way, uh, we have succeeded so far in doing that as a religion. No, I don't. Well, if you look at uh, the three, I would call them the three 
branches of Judaism, the main mm -hmm. three, would, would be the Orthodox, the Conservative, and the Reformed. So when you say the core, the heart, the soul, that that's a to me that's a uh, that's like a can of worms. No, it, in, in my mind, it's the Torah. It's the same in all. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's the, the same. interpretation of the words may may differ, but the words are the same in Hebrew. Well, they're the same, but what, what they have to be the the words of the Torah have to be enforced. Well, that's the that's the point that I was addressing. You, you're you're putting it in an, in other words, and yes, you are correct. That's right. It depends that, on the interpretation. Right, and that's also that would be a big discussion in my. Oh mind. yes, I agree with you. Yes, Don. Yeah, I agree with you, Marty. I think the the heart is the Torah, and I'm always amazed how every copy of the Torah is hand handwritten you know character by character so that, that amazes me over the centuries that that's how it's done so it gives more weight to my question what how do we change how do we abandon those um commandments so easily and even more important has god now abandoned us because of that because god you know, God carried the Israelites across the Red Sea, through the desert, said, I'm going to stick by you, thick and thin. But now he's, he appears, you know, we were crushed by the Babylonians, crushed by the Romans, and then crushed by the, the, the Nazis. Um, and what, you know, as God despite the fact that the Torah is hand copied, are we abandoned? Okay. Mary. Well, um, oh, there you go. Two things that might help us uh, to see what's, uh, I absolutely agree with Marty, what's the core, what's the essence. There are a couple of things I want to say. First of all, What's our, when I say our Judaism, is our role in the world. And what we say is tikkun olam. Mm -hmm. It's the better the world, to fix the world, to repair the world. That's one saying. And the other one is the story of Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel, uh, a guy came to Rabbi Shammai and said, uh, teach me everything about Judaism when I'm standing on one foot. And Shammai got really, really angry and he slapped him and said, get out of here. And when they came to Hillel, and Hillel is the more uh, lenient, uh, Hillel says, and you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the rest go its commentary, go and study. So we have two elements here, and you shall love your, your neighbor as you love yourself. That's a very core issue in our uh, beliefs. And the other one, we, our role is to repair the world. So uh, that's all I had to say. Good ones. Well, uh, so where do we begin today? Where did, where did we leave off, Ruthann? 257. No, oh. yeah, 2517. Uh, 17. 17. I see. Okay. 17. okay, before then, uh, uh, David, are you, uh, the everyone has shifted position on my screen. So, David, if you would like to uh, to, to read your uh, uh, and surprise us with something new. Today, I do have something new to surprise you with. Uh, this last week has been the um, week of shooting stars. A week ago, I was outside and I saw a very bright fireball in the west. 
And a couple of days after that, I saw another bright fireball in the east. And the night before last, after the rain came through, the sky suddenly cleared, I went out and I saw 10 meteors. So to quote today, I have three brief quotations. The first one comes from Thomas Jefferson. In 1807, he said, I would more easily believe that two Yankee professors would lie than that stars would fall from heaven. And then in 1957, Perry Como, catch a falling star and put it in your pocket, <laughs> save it for a rainy day. <laughs> the real one for me comes from uh, John Dunn. Go and catch a falling star. Get with child a mandrake root. Tell me where all past years are or who cleft the devil's foot. Teach me to her, or teach me to hear mermaid singing, or to keep off envy's stinging and find what wind serves to advance an honest mind. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I'll read our, our prayer for today. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kitshanu v'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Amen. 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 Well, uh, if um, uh, if somebody would like... Pastor to Bruce, hi. Hi, Pastor Bruce. Uh, Good to be here. Wildcat, wild cat, an Arizona wild cat. <laughs> It was cold this morning. <laughs> uh, I know, it's great. Anyway, uh, if anyone would like to start, I guess we, uh, um, I'm trying, okay. Uh, in, in verse 17, I guess we start with verse 17. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to start. Okay, why don't you do that? Verse. Okay, and they shall make an ark cover of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Okay, Let, let's stop at that point. Let's stop at that point. Uh, why are you going to uh, make a cover out of pure gold? Because it doesn't tarnish. Okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, does anyone does anyone know uh and this dovetails into our earlier discussion what is it about gold that makes it i know it's rarity but why is it prized in uh jewelry making it's soft. shiny it's soft, soft and shiny and it can and it's malleable yeah if it's pure gold, okay, as opposed to okay, as opposed uh, to that would be the softest of all the uh, the ten, uh, eighteen, and uh, twenty four would be the the purest gold. So it's that makes it soft and easy to easy to work with. Yes, and they add there's uh, they add uh, iron and nickel to to manufacture it to make it uh harder so that it you know it can be used to uh to protect everything otherwise over time it would bend a little bit and that dovetails into our earlier discussion <laughs> bend a little bit don and then larry i was going to mention it's also electrically conductive but that's my own private theory uh, yes, when uh, there are certain aspects to all of these metals and uh, and uh, choices of linen and 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 other other fabrics that uh, would create it could create sparks. Okay, and I know that there other people have gone into maybe the 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 ark was a radio. Who knows? <laughs> we weren't there, so we don't know. Yes, Larry. Okay, pure gold is very soft and breaks apart. Um, but I'm questioning, where do they get the gold? 
you know, mm -hmm. where are the gold mines and how did they process it? And how did they have the knowledge for dealing with this metallurgy? You know, okay. that makes a lot of assumptions here. Make it out of pure gold, easy to say. One of the, well, I'm going to uh, let Amy, uh, she has her hand up. She may have an answer. I don't know. Well, <clears throat> I have an idea. I'm not sure I have an answer, but <clears throat> didn't the Jews bring a lot of gold and treasure out of Egypt? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they may have had it with them at the time without having to mine it. Now, this it's an interesting question. If you were going to look for gold, what would you, where in the world would you go to obtain gold? California. <laughs> okay, what is unique to California? What else does California, is, is, are they notorious for? Okay, uh, Grace, I think you had your hand up. Um, the, the, the quartzites, the, because sure. doesn't gold come from the quartzites? It can be found in quartz, yes, in quartz. That's what I was thinking, I wasn't yes. sure. But I was thinking of California earthquakes. Oh. Okay, now why? Why do they have earthquakes? What causes them? You, you know, we now with plate tectonics, we know that there's a subduction zone. And adjacent to that, you'll have a buildup of mountains and volcanoes. The, you, you run in wherever you have a rift valley, okay? You also have uplifting on one side and volcanoes on the other side as it, be, it and it, it you can so when you think about it the gold comes up with the lava it's very heavy and it and it come and it so it it's then on the surface and while other rock erodes you know depending on the type of flow from the lava while other rock e erodes clumps of gold can be found. And so as a result, wherever you see volcanoes and earthquakes, you are, uh, you, you are uh, more apt to find gold. Yes, Pastor Bruce. After just coming back the last couple of weeks from Jordan and Israel, there's certainly a lot of you know, that kind of, you know, landscape in Jordan and Israel. Yes. The, yes, it is. And if you follow the chain, the mountain chain, we call it the Rocky Mountains, it goes up through Western Canada, okay, and all the way down Mexico and into South America. Where do you find the gold jewelry there? What ancient tribes were able to mine the gold? Incas, Mayas. Exactly. Exactly. Now, yes, go ahead, Larry. Uh, um, metaphorically, America was referred to by um, immigrant uh, Golden Medina. The streets were paved with gold. Okay. Well, we did have a lot of gold as a result of the, the 49ers. But, uh, but the, there is another aspect to this. Gold, what also comes up in the lava, obviously, is iron. And I've mentioned this before. There are several crops that require a lot of iron. Okay. One is coffee. One is tea, all right, and the other are grapes. So 
look at the areas of the world that you get your coffee from, your tea from, okay? And you can even say gold and iron, tin, all the heavy metals, and you now can plot the earth and where all of the major wars on in the on the earth have been fought. Okay, it, you may uh, you may remember in your old history class that that wars were fought for war materials, rivers, okay, and warm water ports. Everything else that we hear today is fluff, okay? You don't fight a war to give women their rights and all kinds of things. You fight a war over those three, three things. And if you think about each one of the major wars, uh, there have been uh, threats. One, one side perceives a threat that it can no longer purchase certain, certain minerals uh, that they depend on. And the same thing with trade routes, which follow these paths as well. And it, it's a very interesting. Think about Spanish exploration, and where in the in the world they 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 went, and why they gave up Brazil, but not the west coast of South and Central America. So it it it, it starts to fit, even if you look at where Cortez goes he goes to the areas where there are volcanoes he explores the southwest u.s yes uh pastor bruce well i was just going to say uh, i just wanted to ask rabbi mary especially a question about the fact that this is the i'll say taporet the mercy seat if you will how important is the gold to be on top of that for what's going to be transpiring there? The mercy seat, the caporet, that's that's what we're talking about here, right? The atonement, seat of atonement, mercy seat, caporet, yeah? Yes? I'm not sure the question. Uh, we didn't get to the cherubim yet. No, no, no. But <laughs> no. the atonement cover. The atonement cover is what it says here, but isn't that the caporet? Yes. Caporet. Caporet. Sorry, wrong emphasis on the wrong yes. syllable. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. You are very, very uh, right uh, uh, about the word because it is caporet and capara. That's a very lovely uh, reminder. Uh, I did not. Hey, uh, examine you. that, but I just love the way that you put those together, like Yom Kippur, yes, Kippur, right. Kapara. Yes, 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 yes. I'm not sure about the connection. Um, one thing is that we have to remember, uh, Larry, go ahead. Because okay, I remember is, Fox gives a good explanation. Oh, good, um, thank you. There are two long-held traditions of trans translating this word, expiation or mercy seat and plain cover. I have kept both ideas in the present rendering. The caporet was used for the purpose of obtaining forgiveness from God and also symbolically as God's footstool to the throne representing, represented by the coffer. Such symbolism is in line with the ancient Near East practice as the keeping of the covenant documents within the footstool. Interesting. So, uh, I don't know if that helps. I, I thought that was really good, Larry. Thank you for sharing that. Well, that was helpful to me. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about was because the acacia, it, the ark itself is made out of the acacia wood, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yep. And if you're required every year to sprinkle blood on the wood that would get a little messy after just a little while and i would think that the gold would be easier to if you have a thing of gold on top it'd be easier to kind of 
you know, clean something off later versus the wood absorbing the blood of the, the lamb and so forth. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I think that I was I was yeah, kind of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Practical like the the rain, practicalness yeah. of the gold. To, for the right, ceremony. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very, now, very good questions, you, you know, people, uh, my friends, we always try to um, accept, extrapolate, I don't remember how to say the word, try to find out where did they get the gold and where did they get the acacia since they were in the desert. And uh, one thing I want to remind, and this is me speaking, that this is a story right. and in the story we can have all kind of element if we want to say where did they get the gold it's a good question i could say you know as uh i think uh, amy said when they left egypt they took all the mm -hmm. jewelry of the people the same question we are going to ask when they make the golden calf yeah it needs a lot of uh, jewelry and that's what they do they collect the jewelry to make that um, personally since it's a story it doesn't matter to me it's wonderful that they put gold and it's wonderful that they had acacia the menorah there was also from gold made out of gold and then when the romans came it was the first thing they took because it was made mm. out of gold but, uh, you know, uh, we can speculate, uh, as, as Dawn does quite a bit, and I think absolutely right, um, you know, where this come from. But I can ask you, where does come from splitting the sea? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, we can take it as Marty said, Let's go to geology and, and figure that out. Um, my preference is to, to take this as a story. And I'm going to do the, the, the word that many don't like. It's a mythology. But, but let's try to figure out. I think that Amy's response, it's a very clear one from the Torah. You know, they took the jewelry from Egypt. So anyway, uh, this is my view, and by now you know my views. So <laughs> it's uh, good. That's it's good. And, and Pastor Bruce, thank you for that uh, singling out that one word. Uh, I, Kapara, uh, yeah, informative. absolutely. Thank I, I just you so it much. Important to to kind of think then in terms of what was happening with that especially on Yom Kippur. You know, there was the sprinkling of the blood for the forgiveness of sins, as Larry said, and all that. And I, I can't imagine a piece of wood without something on top of it that would be a little more cleanable to be. <laughs> I mean, that wood would be kind of messy by the, by the time you did that sure. a few years in a row sure. <laughs> or whatever. So anyway, that. That's kind of As a I'm matter saying. of fact, we're going to now discuss that in relationship to the cherubim. Right. Because, because uh, well, let's read it first. Uh, David, if you would uh, read verse, uh, verses um, 18 through 20. Yeah, let's see. 18 through 20. Um, and thou shalt make two cherubim of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them at the two ends of the ark cover, and make one cherub at the one yeah. end, and one cherub at the other end of one piece with the ark cover. Shall ye make the cherubim of the two ends thereof? Okay. Now, the word in Hebrew, excuse me, uh, the, is kerubim. It's with a K with a dot. So it's kerubim, like kapara and kapore. Kerubim. My sorry. apologies. I'm sorry. Oh, for <laughs> No, okay. don't, don't. Now, Larry has his hands up. 
Yeah, okay. Um, this time it's from Ulther. Um, if we go back to Genesis 3.24, and he drove out the human and set up east of the Garden of Eden, Eden, the cherubim, and the flame of the whirling sword. Now, he says here, the cherubim, a common feature of ancient Near East mythology, and not to be confused with the round-cheeked darling of the Renaissance iconography. The root of the term either means hybrid or an inversion of consonants mount, seed, and they are the winged beasts probably awesome aspect um, on which the sky god of the old Canaanite myth and the poetry of the Psalms goes riding through the mm -hmm. air. So um, we have that cherub beam back in Genesis 3. Okay, very good. Uh, and yes, uh, Plout says something very similar. And uh, any other comments about that? Okay, I'm going to read it uh, from one point. I don't want to duplicate what uh, what um, uh, what uh, I don't want to duplicate what uh, Larry just said. But the cherubim and the ark co uh, cover the caporet, uh, caporet, were of one piece, and the latter was described by Ezekiel, okay, uh, with God uh, in, in relationship to God's chariot. Uh, and then he, above the chariot, Ezekiel saw the likeness of the divine throne, and doubtlessly he meant by this that he saw the cherubim. Uh, and uh, it describes God's throne uh, on the cherubim in uh, Samuel, in, in 1 Samuel uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. And uh, it, it also uh, was, is very interesting that one of the Sepharim, is mercy represents mercy and the other cherubim represents judgment okay. and so this is a uh, a, a very interesting uh, concept of uh, I don't see I don't see uh, Ricky so, uh, uh, and I'll, is she doing okay, Ruthann? I haven't spoken to her since okay. yesterday morning, so. Okay. But she Ricky, was doing okay then. Ricky knows something about the uh, uh, Kab uh, uh, Kabbalah and uh, the Sephirotic chart. And it's interesting that uh, opposing one another it, on one side is uh is judgment and the other side is love or mercy which i think is very it's just a very interesting play between the two and uh so somewhere in between is is probably a, a merciful judgment <laughs> yes if, yeah. if you will yeah i heard that there is no justice without um without rahamim without charity without what was the other word you said mercy without mercy or love yes yeah yeah there isn't you cannot do justice without it because um if you think about it you know justice is when a poor and a rich uh do the same sin you cannot say that they have to get the same punishment. That's what the Torah talks, and that's what the rabbis talk. And the example, for example, is a midrash. There's uh, this guy who's very rich. 
uh, uh, comes to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, see what happened to me. My chicken fell into the milk. Can I eat it? And the rabbi said, uh, no, you cannot eat it. You need to buy a new chicken. And then a poor person comes and says the same thing. Rabbi, look what happened. He fell there. And he said, no problem. You can eat that chicken. There's no problem with it. <clears throat> and someone asked, well, Rabbi, it's the same situation. Why are you doing that? Well, he can afford another chicken. This guy cannot afford. So this is the type of justice that we talk about with mercy. And uh, if we look at all the examples of that, you'll see that that's, you know, when a mother steals bread for their kids, you cannot put her in jail. You need to use the love and mercy into that. Somewhere in between just, uh, you know, uh, judgment and love uh, is you have to make space for atonement as well yeah. it's not it's yeah. not just for the judges okay to to do this but atonement is somewhere in between and has to be taken into account mm -hmm. okay yeah. so uh it, it it's it's a a very a, a very interesting thing by the way in our in in american courts we do something that is a little that sort of picks up on this theme you have there it, before a, somebody receives a very stiff penalty because they were found guilty by the court. There is a time period given to the um, the perpetrator of the crime to atone, and people may get up and say how good a person this may have been uh it, 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 i forget the exact term but it, it's done to try to temper the severity of the judgment yes uh amy uh the courts also take into account <clears throat> mitigating circumstances and that's what yes. rabbi mary yes was addressing and so so you can see how this plays out even in in a modern day setting it is not it is not a hundred it is not just like the queen of hearts off with his head <laughs> you know it's got to be something uh it, it there, there has to be something else that has to be taken into account to to be sure maybe that's what is uh justice justice shall you you know dot 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 you know it, you want to always be sure that it's a just justice okay yes mary uh i want to pose the question to all of us if you remember the ten commandments and i hope you do in the very beginning it says you shall not make any figures in the shape of um, whatever and here we make two figures mm -hmm. that are facing each other, facing, they use the word face, in the, in the, in the tabernacle. And they're made of gold. Uh, and I don't have a response. Uh, I can speculate. So I'm just throwing it to the group. Larry, you may have something in your in your book, uh, in one of your books about that. Uh, eventually, this was discontinued because people they out of fear that people would start worshiping yeah. the cherubim. You know, thinking that they had certain magical powers equivalent to God. Yes. Uh, uh, Please, uh, Donald. Don. Yeah, I would, <laughs> speculating again, <laughs> I would, it seems to me that the cherubim um, were for the purpose of uh, sacrifice to God. You know, they were, they were part of the uh, sacrificial ritual to 
um, God, and, and, not, and not in any way toward any other God. To be worse. So I, I don't see a conflict between that and the commandment, the first commandment. I don't know. Personal opinion. I no value, okay. no validity whatsoever. <laughs> Interesting. Amy. Well, I agree with Don because I don't think the cherubim were worshipped an item of worship, um, as was the gold calf. So I think that it's permissible or understandable or acceptable to have them as um, symbolic symbols over protecting the Torah uh, on the ark. I I have I would agree with you. Uh, I think that the, the there's uh, all I can say is uh, that uh, and this is from Plow, uh, and it sort of encompasses some of this discussion. Uh, one must simply conclude that the cherubim were permitted or perhaps merely to, merely tolerated images while all others were prohibited. With the destruction of the first temple, they disappeared and were not reconstructed when the second temple was built. Therefore, Jewish law rejected even a hint of imagery that could conceivably lead to idol worship inside or outside sacred settings. Okay, so this sort of goes through all of these different discussions. So, uh, and maybe they were different poles through which a spark could go. <laughs> okay, yes, Michael. Yeah, I think you would find that in the Orthodox uh, to, to be very, very strict, if I could say that, uh, in, in creating any kind of an image, no matter what it is, no matter how minor it is, it, that this would uh, be part of the Orthodox, uh, I believe, the Orthodox belief and teaching. Okay. Now, Don, uh, Don, here is the question to you that you posed. I mean, not to you, you posed it. Why after what Marty said? After the temple, they removed the cherubim, cherubim, cherubim. They removed them. Where does it say in the Torah that you should remove them? That's your question, right? Yeah, it's, my question is, where does God give the Hebrew people the license to deviate from his commandment? And that, that's the basic question. I, I'm a, and it's really a technical question. I'm just looking for a place where where that permission is given to us. Um, I don't have any, you know, no value judgments or anything about it. I just was just wondering if there's uh, if there's an amendment provision. I, I, I think uh, Pastor Bruce is in the New Testament. Isn't it right at the end? Isn't it forbidden to make any changes at all? the text yes um it says don't change what's here that's yeah. right so don't add or subtract don't add or subtract yeah so I, it's a technical question you know is where is that in in our in our book well maybe people now, don't don what do you do with the rule in answering bruce uh, Pastor Bruce as well. What do you do with when the child is misbehaving with the parents? You need to bring him to the uh, wall and stone it. Would you change that or not? Well, that's, that's, child my question. that's basically my question. You know, we, <clears throat> you know, God laid down the rules. And he said, "Here's what you here's what you will obey, and uh, you know anyone who disobeys will be punished." 
And then I'm looking for, okay, circumstances change, centuries go by. Where, you know, what we call human common sense would say, we don't really want to stone children or, or we don't want to stone people for minor infractions. Um, but if we do relax that rule, then we're deviating. And I'm just let, again, uh, it's a good point, Don. It's an excellent point. Yeah. Let, hey, let's hear Amy from, was before me. Oh, okay. Amy Bruce. and then Pastor Bruce. Well, I, I believe that we've been commanded to obey the law of the land, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And to me, that implies... That's, 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 right, Amy. That's, that's the New Testament, isn't it, Pastor Bruce? Render unto Caesar? Yes. <laughs> that's the New Testament. <laughs> yes, but I think there's the understanding in, in the Hebrew Bible that we are bound to the law of the land, which means to me that you have to be flexible because the law of the land is beyond your control. It's wherever you're living, you have to follow the rules. And to me, that's the built-in understanding that you have to be flexible but, but in, in your thinking and mm -hmm. application of your faith. But the early Israelites... Uh, Don, Don, wait a second. They you know, they were the state. I understand, Don. Pastor Bruce has had his hand up. Let's 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 hear him. If you don't mind me reading from Yahov, um, which is in the Brit Hadashra, the New Testament, if you will, um, there's something that really goes with what we're talking about here, I think, because it's about mercy and judgment. And I think that in chapter two here, it says, um, I don't, I, I'm trying to figure out exactly where to read, but it's talking about the sin of favoritism. It's, you know, like favoring people over another people and so forth and so on. But then it goes, if you show favoritism, you're committing sin and are convicted by the Torah as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole Torah, but stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all points. For the one who said, do not commit adultery also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you did not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you have still become a transgressor of the Torah. And here's the point I'm trying to get to actually here. I just wanted to give you a little bit ahead of that. So speak and act as those who will be judged according to the Torah that gives freedom. For judgment is merciless to the one who does not show mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I don't know what you think about that statement, but I think that really has a lot to do with what we're talking about here yeah. in this particular thing. And so the idea is that, yeah, the Torah is this standard that is here. We as human beings are lower, not here. <laughs> we're not That's here. Right. And if we commit one sin, we're guilty. There's guilt. But the statement for judgment is merciless to the one who does not show mercy and mercy triumphs over judgment tells us a lot about all that that you're talking about, Don, is that there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. Well, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that we don't do or can't do or wouldn't do based on now. And the point being is that judgment is there but it doesn't have any mercy if you don't show it to someone else in any kind of given situation. You know, stone the woman because she committed adultery. Boom. I, I want to give you a personal example that maybe you might find interesting. My grandfather was a bootlegger in the 1920s. He made hooch. Okay, that was my grandfather, right? It was illegal in the 20s to make hooch. But it was also the depression. And he didn't have a very good job. And so Mary said something about this earlier. I'm just giving you my personal example of my grandfather. He was making hooch illegally. 
the um, FBI found out about it or whatever the whatever the government agency that was taking care of such things. My grandfather was shot to death in his backyard with my father watching that happen based on making hooch because he couldn't afford to pay for things for his family of eight children. Mary, you mentioned this earlier as, as yeah. well, what do you do if this and what do you do if that? Well, That's right. there was no mercy for my, for my grandfather. The people just shot him. Of course he had a pistol too. So <laughs> there was this, I have the cover. I have the cover of the Laramie Times of that particular date. Wow. That describes every detail of that. And his hospital dying words were, I was just trying to support my family for making a little hooch. <laughs> that was his dying words. And so mercy, judgment, all these things that we are, are, much bigger than us in so many ways, but yet we have to be practical. We have to say, okay, <laughs> we have freedom within the word of God, within the Torah, within the Bible, if you will, to, to know that mercy can and will triumph over judgment and that we are called to be merciful to people. If God is gonna be merciful to us, we better be merciful to others. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. That's the basic thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, the entire story of Les Miserables is about this very yeah, yeah. issue. Okay. Why do you steal that loaf of bread? Okay. And the whole sequence of events that follows is a battle between mercy and judgment you know or justice and 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 you want it's somewhere in between and you have to take this into account and that that's why it's such an important uh an important book and hey they make movies and plays and and you know i want to make i want to make musicals. my grandfather's story a movie it probably uh, sounds <laughs> that would be an interesting one. That would be an interesting one. Yeah, okay, Grace has had her hand up, and then right by Mary. Okay, I, before we move on to the, the true topic here, I just wanted to ask Pastor Bruce, you said Laramie Times in Wyoming? Yes, that's where that happened. Yeah, okay. I know exactly where that is. I was just there a couple of weeks ago picking up my guitar. Interesting. Yeah, we have a lot. And we were talking about, you know, um, the law of the lands. Well, <laughs> Wyoming, Wyoming is the biggest outlaw state. They call us the outlaw state. Well, the Wild West was very wild at that time, too. <laughs> yes. It's still pretty wild. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Rabbi Mary, you were t I, uh, uh, I remember only one one thing I wanted to say. Well, first of all, when uh, Chava, Eve, and Adam ate from the book, from the tree mm -hmm. of not knowledge, it was the tree of knowledge, good and bad. So that issue of free thought, free will, existed from creation right the other thing that um that uh amy thought and i don't remember one thing i want to say but the rule of the land the rule of the land is a very powerful thing don that uh we had to do if for example in the united states we have to bury people in a coffin right but the tradition of burying Jews is in, a, 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 you know, just covering with a uh, shroud. Word. Shroud. Yes. And that's how you bury them. But the rule of the land is that. So you need to do it. So this is one of the things that happen as a consequence of where are you living? What are the rules over there? So um, that's something that happened. And now, uh, and I remember, uh, Pastor Bruce, 
we are aware that after canonizing the Torah, and I think even the rabbis, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not good at numbers, then the New Testament was written. And the Testament that was written started uh, changing things that were not merciful, that didn't make sense, of punishing people in a way that did not make sense. Uh, I know what I wanted to say. Do you remember our first conversation, if God is among us or God is inside us? So if God is inside us, then when we make a decision, you can say that's the voice of God. Then uh, human beings now work with God based on their brain and their heart. So changes might be, if you believe that God is inside human beings, even if the word of God doesn't say clearly, you should stop doing this, you should do that and that, human beings are part of it. And, and again, only if you believe that God is everywhere and in your heart, inside you. Good point. You know, I just wanted to interject. We've read many examples of this concept. Uh, the Garden of Eden was mentioned. And what happens with, uh, you know, uh, with Adam and Eve. Uh, we, this, the, in, Abra in, the, in the Abraham story, you have, you have uh, an attempt at compassion. Okay. And there are different stories that we can we can address there. In in Jacob, that too, culminating with Joseph. And I mean, he could have taken it, it would have been a, a just decision to kill the brothers who who tried to kill him. But no, he doesn't. Uh, uh, and and we're seeing this in all, many of the different stories coming to this, if you will, apex. You know, it, uh, it, 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 it's a very important concept in Judaism. Uh, and also it dovetails into Tikkun Olam. Because in order to do justice, you you have to repair the world, but you have to be very careful how you do it. Although you may think you're doing something right, you have to anticipate, well, what are the other possibilities? And you be so before you take action, you have to really do uh, diligence to be sure that you come up with the right solution otherwise many people would be hurt so it, it there's many stories that that dovetail into this i think i think helene has been trying to raise her hand yes if god if you believe that god is our father i, I think every religion believes that we have one father and it's God. Am I wrong? Please help me. No, you're, you're, you're right. Is that, that's, uh, we have one God. He is our father. Regardless of the religion, where how you get to him, it mm. doesn't matter. It's to get to God. And God makes the rules. He's the father who loves all his children. It doesn't matter whether you're Christian or Jewish or Mormon. He loves his children. When a father loves a child and the child makes a mistake, a four-year-old or a 40-year-old or a 90-year-old, and they make a mistake, does God punish them for the mistake? Ah, sometimes he gives them a hard time and makes them go through pain because underneath the pain is a lesson. 
And God teaches us through love, compassion, acceptance. A child who hurts somebody else, is he punished by God? Is he punished? No, no, he's not. We must understand compassion comes from God and sometimes challenges. And when he makes us go through tough times, underneath the tough time is a learning. Yes, That's all yes. I wanted to say. Good words. Very good words, Helene. Thank you. Yes, Don. Yeah, thank you, Helene. Um, I think we all want that God. In, in the Torah, there he does mention punishment. Um, and with so many good points that are coming up here, I might have a problem going back. But first of all, Pastor Bruce, I think Pastor Bruce is going to have us all baptized by noon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, going back to uh, going back to uh, the point about um, um, that Rabbi Miri was making about we have to obey the law of the land regardless of what the Torah tells us that really to me didn't apply until the Babylonians crushed uh, Israel, but before that, Jewish society was a theocracy, so there was no difference between the law of the land and the law of the state. And so the Torah ruled. You know, you couldn't say, well, the you know during during the time of the kings and the judges, it was, it was all the same law. But then the Babylonians uh, conquered. Israel. And then this, that, that's when the law of the land appeared and the problem of that, you know, how do we serve um, God and man at the same same time? Um, so it was a long time after this. But, and also going back before the Exodus, when we were reading about Abraham's descendants, there was no Torah at the time. Uh, so there, there was there was a family judgment as to who got punished and and, and who didn't. But I, I get so interested in this period we're in because it's the delivery of the law, you know, to Moses, and that that marks a whole new period in Jewish history. So, but from here until the Babylonians was what a thousand years maybe. So it was a thousand years of theocracy when this was the only law that applied. Um, so maybe, and then I'm going to shut up because I, I'm, I'm going all over the place here. Oh, okay. Thanks, okay. thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Don. Thank you. Uh, any other comments about what we have been re uh, discussing or, or what we just finished reading? All right, David or whoever, uh, let's read on. Starting, I guess, uh, verse 21. Anyone want to read? Yeah, yeah. I can okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, verse 21. 21 and thou shalt put the dark the and the ark cover above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the the testimony that i shall give thee okay so uh uh we this this has been alluded to uh what what testimony My guess is it would be the uh, Shema Yisrael. Okay, the Shema. Okay. What else could it be? Any ideas? I know you you have to think you, some. You may have to fast forward. 
But keep it in mind that this has not been given to the people yet. Everybody always thinks the Ten Commandments were in there. I mean, that's the... Or that's, is it... The, that's right. Or is it I mean, the Torah? Yeah, the, or the whole... Yeah, the, the whole, whole book of the law. Yeah. Or is hey. it all of the tablets that Moses and and God made? And maybe the broken pieces were easier than the bigger pieces. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> because guess what? <laughs> That makes, well, the broken pieces make sense to me only because, you know, if that's going to be the mercy seat and, and the judgment seat, then, oh, well, uh, okay, what what needs to be forgiven here? You know, well, maybe the smashing of the pieces by Moses. I, I don't know. I I have all kinds of fun things thinking and going through my brain at times. But the, it's okay. It's okay. No. But it, the it, it, broken pieces make sense to me with the mercy seat. <laughs> Psychiatrists would call this loose associations. <laughs> it's okay. Any other ideas? So we, we're going to have to read on. Yes, Amy. Well, to me, the broken pieces are a testimonial, you know, a reminder of the history of yes. um, not obeying and uh, worshiping a false idol and um, all that. So I think it was very important to include them as well as the tablets that were intact. Okay, well, we're going to keep reading until we find out exactly what winds what up. Winds. Okay. The testimony in my, in my scripture is capitalized. Yes. And I the word testimony... So that means something also, and I can't, I don't know what it means yet, but I, we'll have to keep talking. Pact is in in in. Uh, what verse? What in, verse? What verse? Um, this is uh, verse twenty one. Twenty one. It says the test. I inside the ark. You will put the testimony, capital testimony, that I will That's give you. Right. I've been trying to figure and that here, out. And I'm not figuring it out yet. <laughs> in mine, it it has packed with a capital P. Interesting. So we, however we want to look at this, this is a, an extremely important document, whatever it's going to turn out. Right. So I just, I just wondered about the capital. So, yeah. so and we, we, no capitals in Torah. There's no that's Hebrew right. capitals. <laughs> so, so if there are no capitals, why has someone made it with a capital T or a capital P? Because it's, because that's because what... it's the word of God. Mm. You know what? Don't you underline things that you feel that they're important? Yeah. Yeah, I do that all the time, even in the in the Kindle, you know. So the writer of this, when he translated, felt that this is important and wrote. A capital letter. We can understand it differently, but that's my explanation for the capital. Okay. So now we, so the pact is a very important, a very important object and or, or testimony, very important. Uh, and to to keep it sacred, okay. Uh, so verse twenty two, David, if you would continue reading. Okay, and that's I think the important the key is verse twenty two here. Right. And there I will meet with thee, and I will speak with thee from above the ark cover, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Okay. Very good. Yes, Larry. To me, this is such a major change in the form of communication between God and people. At Sinai, he spoke with 
fire, thunder, a trembling of the earth. He was distant and off power. Here it's now, let's, okay, if not uh, coming together, but it's more of an intimate communication. I'll set a time and place for you to meet. I mean, to me, it is a major um, change in relationship. Okay, very important, very important what you said. Any other comments? Isn't it, I just find it curious, when, when we go back into the story of Abraham, and we talk about uh, the, uh, what was it between the parts? I forget the exact wording. It goes way back into Abraham. It deals with the circumcision. Okay. And it's, it's, it's this, it's a sign of a covenant between man and God. So when we think about this, uh, is that another reason why the cherubim are facing one another and there's a space in between? And you have the law on one side, man on the other side. Maybe this goes back to why man is important in creation. Because we question. We have that power. And in the story of Abraham, he's questioning God or the spirit of God. In the story of Jacob, he's wrestling either with the spirit of God, an angel, or God himself. Is that something that is necessary to take into consideration? That the law is on one side, given by God, and man is on the other side that is always trying to figure things out. And somewhere in between, like we're doing, we're adding Midrash into what's written here. We're filling in empty spaces. And what we have read before is full of empty spaces, and we have taken advantage of those empty spaces. And maybe God took those empty spaces into account between answering Cain until the answer is apparent, okay? Yes, you are your brother's keeper. So the space is very important. The gap is important here. Not just, not just the word. Maybe we're supposed to mull it over. And maybe that's your answer, Don. I don't know. I don't know. It's worthwhile thinking about. So anyway. Any other comments about the pact? And, and the pact will also include all that I will command you concerning the Israelite people, which obviously is in the Torah, all the mitzvot. I assume this is the mitzvot and everything else that we're supposed to follow. But there are exceptions that come up periodically as told uh, by God and Moses. There are, there are exceptions to the rule. Any other comments? Okay. David, you're on. And thou shalt make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a handbreadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. 
close by the border shall the rings be for places for the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be borne with them. And okay. Thou shalt... okay. Any, any other, uh, any comments about all of this? Any ideas? Yeah, done. This is possibly facetious, but you would think they'd put it on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> well, why wouldn't you want to have it put on wheels? You know, I'm not sure because it's a, with all that gold, it must be pretty heavy to lug around. Um, yeah. But you know, the wheel was invented, but <laughs> I don't know. It, it seemed like. Okay, first Amy okay, and then Grace. Well, I, it's not practical, um, Don, to put them, put it on wheels because imagine trying to push that through the desert sands and mountains and over rocks and boulders. Um, it would be quite an ordeal to tempt that. All right. Um, they had chariots in those days, and they went over the same terrain. And I'm going to leave that because it's not important at all. Just, well, there may it may still be important for another reason. Uh, yes, p please, uh, Grace. All right. Um, what I'm thinking is that God's telling you you're going to be mobile <laughs> for a while, right? You're not settling down just yet. You know, you're going to be moving moving and going and moving and it's going to be a struggle because whether it would be on wheels or you know with these handles made of these poles with you know reinforced with the gold that's giving right um it's just that that's my main thought with this is is that you're going to struggle and you're going to keep moving you're going to you know there's it's going to be a struggle because that's a lot of weight to lift and to carry. And it's going to take unity amongst the people to carry and move this thing. So you have to work as a collection of people together in the community. That's what I'm getting. Excellent point. Excellent point. I don't know who had their hand up. Go ahead, first. Larry can go first. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Back to Fox's commentary. Yeah. The table and its implements, like some of the features of the tabernacle, are holdovers from a more blatantly pagan model, where the gods were seen to be in need of nourishment. By thus using conventions of worship common throughout the ancient Near East, Israel expressed its desire to serve God, even while it was aware he was not the sort of deity who requires food and drink. I have the same thing in Plout. Yes. Yes. Very good. Yes. P okay. My, my, point, my point here is, like you said before, isn't this a co conversation between God and Moses? Like you said, he is not talking to the people. Correct. So at this point in time, they are not wandering for 40 years because they haven't built a golden calf. So maybe that's why it was made like this. It didn't have to be on wheels because it was going to be a short distance that they were going. They, Excellent they weren't going point. for a long time. Excellent point. Now, the, the commandments for your information... I, I agree with Grace because if we, as we continue reading, uh, every tribe is getting a tribe, getting a job. One will do this and one will do that, and every tribe is going to do something else. And in a tribe, you have many people. So I think it's a cooperation that works together into oh, that. The that other point that I want to make is that this is addressed to a singular you not you but 
you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that we have to remember that that's happening. Now, uh, another thing that's coming, this is a preview, you know, <laughs> this is a preview, that everything that's sitting on the table, they'll tell you how you fold it and how you wrap it so you can take it with you, which is enormous information. And if we look, uh, uh, Pastor Bruce, correct me, I'm not sure that all the, uh, the movements uh, do the same thing. But when you go to church, you have the cup and you have the, uh, the, the scent and you have, and, and the, the tradition is in, in Catholicism at least, that this represent uh, the blood of Christ and this, but they still exist. So uh, Larry mentioned the word pagan, and we have to remember where this society comes from. Mm -hmm. We are not out of nothing. So there are a lot of things that are taken, borrowed, implemented, Okay. Uh, metaphorically speaking, I uh, just, this is a mighty load to bear. Okay. Yes. What I'm giving yeah. you. Okay. It's not just words. It's the importance of those words. And this you're going to convey for all time. And it's going to require the teamwork. It's going to require taking into account a distribution of labor. That's similar to what Yitro said to Moses. You've got to, you, you have to share the burden to make it happen. And so maybe this all dovetails one story into another to, to ultimately come down to the fact that in order to remain a people, everyone has to do and chip in so that the entire group benefits. Okay? It also means that everyone in that, uh, in that situation is very important. You can't afford to do things complete, to deviate and to, to say, oh, they're, they're not the priests. I shouldn't, you know, they're, they're lower than me. No, without those people, the priests can't work. So it's, it's a very important concept, I think. Yes, Ruthann. I was just going to say, but part of what, our thinking is, is that we know the rest of the story. Yes. So, so what we've been saying right now wouldn't have been any different had the golden calf not been made, had Moses not broken the first set of you know, stones. I mean, it would have still been the same thing. You know, the only difference is that we wouldn't probably been 40 years in the desert and, you know, who knows what life would have been. But Basically, what's going on here wouldn't have been any different. We would have still had to cooperate with each other. Yes, yes. Yes, Rabbi Mary. I want to pose the question to the entire group because I don't have an answer and I would like to learn from you. Uh, why so many details? Does that move the story forward? Why? What's that about? I'll let, go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Um, I read ahead a little bit because because the details that are talked about in the very last verse of the uh, chapter of which we are in. It just says, see to it that you make them according to their pattern being shown to you on the mountain. All well, these patterns, everything about this from my perspective shows a pattern of something that is coming later. 
That's the way I look at it. There's a pattern and there's a result of the pattern. And sooner or later, everybody's going to know about the pattern and, and that there's a reason for the pattern. I think if, if, you know, I don't know all the reasons of why these things are so important, except for gold is valuable. This kind of wood is valuable. Um, why everything has to be covered with this and that it's valuable. Um, don't I, that is kind of not up here, but there's a pattern here. There's, there's patterns of which then you continue through the, all the Psalms and through different books, you know, that are written about these things and what happens even as you go up into the Maccabees with the menorah and, you know, just different, there's all kinds of patterns here that just kind of really um, show up later. And so I guess my, my answer would be that why do we have details is because they're a pattern of something to come later and we can relate to that pattern and go, oh, this is why maybe that is why that's the way it is. There's patterns, there's repeating things, there's, there's, there's reminders, there's um, remember, we always say remember, <laughs> remember, remember, remember. So remember this, and then here's a pattern later is what I kind of think. You. I'm going, if, 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 oh yes, Amy, please. Um, I think that they're symbolic of thoughts and issues and important uh, feelings from God. He had a reason that he wanted the cherubim. He had, they were symbolic of important messages that he wanted the Jews to carry with him and keep in their hearts. Good point, good point. Yes, Don. I always tell myself to keep my mouth shut on this subject, but um, the, 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 ta the, the tabernacle is a device. It's not like, you know, build a pile of rock, and, you know, and that would be my altar. It's a, it's a device and, it, and uh, it can be, I think it can be shown that the, the tabernacle during a period of significant seismic activity when there is electromagnetic magnetic fields at the surface of the earth, that you would get with that construction, with the conductive gold and the cherubim with the gap between the two of them, the short gap, you would get an electrical discharge occasionally, depending on the strength of that field, that would zap, you'd see like a, uh, you know, glue electric arc jump between the two. Um, there's, uh, there's a professor of electrical engineering decades ago who was also a, a pastor. Um, I'm, not, I'm not original with this. There's quite a few people who subscribe to this theory. But I think I that's the reason I think it's so carefully described is that if you don't do it right, it won't work. Um, and it won't. And after that, after everything subsided, it wouldn't work anymore because the your electric field is gone. So it, by now, everybody can open up their ears again. But, I, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to add one one more thing. Uh, if if uh, there's, uh, I tend to look at it in a slightly different way, taking into account what Don has said and. and Pastor Bruce and Rabbi Mary, details are very important. No matter what occupation you can think of, even if it's a pastor or a rabbi, the choice of words is very, very critical. The details, it's the details that count. Think of a leaf. Do you just see a blob of green? Or is there structure in that leaf? Is there structure in the human body? Is there structure in all animal life? Is there structure in the, the rock? The soil? And the answer to is, it's all of the above. It's the details 
And so the details make the part, the, it, it, the details when put together will give you the whole. Okay. So you not only think of it as one object, think of it being taken apart. We do this every week when we discuss Torah. We, t we look for the details and we focus on that and discuss them. So we, we educate ourselves by knowing more details. By the way, in medicine, you want your doctor to not just say, good morning, I know what's wrong with you. This is all that we have to do. You complained of indigestion here, take some Tagamet. No, why do you have that indigestion? It may not be an acid peptic problem. It may be gallbladder disease, pancreatic disease. There's much more too. You have to ask more questions to get down to the details. And that's just one fine example. An engineer, the same thing. Uh, you have to understand each one of the components of a structure. So you do not run into problems with resonance and harmonics, which will cause a bridge to collapse or a building to collapse. It's the detail work, the choice of material, everything. And that's part of this. There's one thing that we haven't addressed, and that is how many different professions have been have been incorporated so far in this discussion. Think about it. Somebody had to chop down the wood for the occasion. Somebody had to trim it down and make the poles. Some The gold, you needed somebody to do the smelting. You needed somebody to do the pounding to make the figures and everything. That requires an artistic touch. So there's a lot going on here that is not just a chunk of gold. It's not just a chunk of wood. This has been craftsmanship that's being pulled, to, that's being requested. And we, we, we can have that discussion. Who made, where does the linen come from? Where did the dyes come from? Somebody has to be an expert in each one of these fields. So the details are very important. Yes, Michael. You know, I always wondered about this, and I always ask the question. I never see any details when it comes to the manufacturing of musical instruments. Mm. Why is there so much detail given to everything and the... the uh, uh, you would, I would think, because music was a great part, to play a an important part. Let me say it that way. In 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 in, in, in is is in, in Jewish history, going way back with the lyre and the horns, the the sounding of the horns. Mm -hmm. No detail that I could find that anybody can answer me was given to how the. The, the horns were made out of what instrument, the diameter of the uh, the, the, the shaft, all, and it's all missing. And that is an important consideration to, it, it, because even a piano, okay, has, in, has multiple parts and the strings have to be just right so that you can have a tonal scale. And if you really study those, those wires and wires wrapped around wires and everything, it's unbelievably complex inside that box. And uh, then you have your pedals and how they, they dampen or enhance resonance. So based yeah. on what you're saying, why is all of that missing? 
when you look at the details of other things, everything right. has got to be in place. So why in that particular field, that area, all of that is completely missing? That's it's a good question. Anybody can anybody think of an answer to that? It, we didn't go into it. And by the way, none of this is also mentioned in what we're reading here. It's about all the work and the fine detail that had to go into things. Yes, Don. Well, maybe the, the tabernacle was actually the first electric guitar. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, that's a good one. Yes, Grace. Okay, so I think that the detail came into being with instruments over time, just like, you know, our relationship with God increases, changes, develops over time. Um, I have a very beautiful guitar that is a Japanese classical and mm. the details and the sound. When I pick and play and pluck at this thing in the racquetball court, <laughs> which is great acoustics, you know, I hear it very well and differently than when I play it in my living room or you know, sitting on a stool. But I think that over time, musical instruments, you know, you look at um, perhaps you've seen the Stradivarius. Um, play, you know, the, the classical violin, right? There is a, you know, musical instrument that has a lot of detail and the wood is very important. Mm -hmm. It's very important how it's handled, yes. how it's carried in, what kind of container it's put into because it will hold its valuable sound over time. And yes. the guitar that I have has gotten better with age because of that wood. I'm That's all I know. Yeah, I'm referring to, uh, uh, thank you, Grace. I'm referring to the uh, the musical instruments that were played uh, uh, and during, the, during the time of the Israelites. And... Uh, that's what I'm referring to when everything else at that time had detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything there had detail. And if you want to, say, if you say over time, it still doesn't. Those, those instruments that are played today, I don't see any detail for them either. So when you say over time, I'm not, I'm, uh, I, I don't know if you're addressing the, uh, uh, the general question that I asked. Well, probably not, but I, what I'm, I'm getting at is they, they evolved over time. Maybe in the beginning, the Lear, you know, um, it, it wasn't as craftily made as it is today. It still exists. It's still a very archaic instrument like the piano, but they're all, you know, stringed and the, the strings and the sound and the tone and the, the hearing, the Every guy would say, well, you know, I'm going to help you make this better over time because they don't sound as good as they could, right? Uh, that's just my thought. I, I don't know. It's not right or wrong. I'm trying to contradict you or no. maybe what? not even answer you. I'm just thinking in terms of the instrument that I own and have that I know has gotten better sounding over time. Well, what you're addressing, Grace, I agree with. What you're talking about, I completely agree with. But I'm talking about really something that uh, that has get given great detail to whatever was made uh, in ancient times for the Israelites. But maybe the gap, maybe ah. the, the absence of writing this all down has led to different sounds coming from different woods and Different const different forms and everything. Maybe that's part of our job to fill in those missing pieces. Now there are a bunch of hands that went up before. I know Rabbi Mary had it. I know Amy. Well, uh, 
First, Marcia um, had her hand up. Oh, hand. Marcia, okay. For a long, Marcia, long please. time. Please, I'm sorry. Okay, I know there were so many hands that went up. That's all I wanted is to point out Marcia had been waiting a while. Oh, okay. Marcia, please. You're sitting in a darker area. That's why it's hard to, to know. No, no, it, it's because of the window adjacent behind you and to the side. It, it puts you in a shadow. Marcia, you're muted. Okay. I think that just reading all these details, thinking of what God is doing, and then going back to the beginning of this book, and how God created the world in seven days. And he just said, he created it. He did this, he did that, he did this. And then the world started going. And maybe he saw that these children needed some more education. They needed some ways of doing instead of just doing. So it just seems that it's another phase in life that the plan and the details have to be given also to satisfy him that the world is what he wanted. Good. That's an interesting thought. I like that. Very good, Marsha. Thank you. Uh, I know Rabbi Mary. I'm, I'm overlooking some people, I think. Well, maybe not. Go ahead, uh, Rabbi Mary. Now, once upon a time, a person was walking and he saw uh, a mason uh, putting woods in a building. And he asked, what are you doing? Well, I'm putting the wood. And he asked another person, I'm putting the bricks. And, uh, and he asked the electrician, well, I'm putting the lights. And then there is a woman that's sweeping the floor and he said what are you doing i'm building a cathedral so what she is doing is for the entire thing it's not what she is doing now my partner complains that i don't see details that i don't care about it <laughs> it's not true but to certain details but when I listen to, if I go to a concert, uh, Michael, uh, I'm going to the concert because the Philharmonic is playing. And I'm going because of the music of the Philharmonic. And I don't pay attention how much the trumpet and how much the, the fiddle, the, uh, how much each one of them play and listen to uh, to each one. I'm coming for the concert. And maybe what makes me think when I ask the question about the details, what I want is the entire thing. Because, uh, Marty, when you said um, we look at the leaves, well, I look at the tree. I don't look at each one, especially when I paint. I look at the whole because I think that the bottom line is that we want the whole. Amy is not the eyes and the nose and the face and the hair. She's not that. She's Amy. So uh, that's a question that we ask, and I would ask here. All these details lead to what complete thing we want. Very good. You've just pointed out the differences between analysis on one side and synthesis on the other. <laughs> very, right. very well That's stated. That's right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yes, Ruth Ann. Okay, kind of an answer to Michael's question, kind of like Mary says, this is our story, okay? So these are things in this story that, that are unique to our people. 
but one time they may not be unique to our people now, but at one point in time, they were unique to our people. Um, if it wasn't unique to our people, it's not in this story. And that's what I'm thinking. Right. Musical instruments, yes, they were very, very important, but they were probably invented by outsiders. And Michael, when did music start to be written down? <laughs> How many how many years ago when, when what was music written down uh centuries not yeah, but many not, but, but not but not thousands of years so that's what i'm saying that the fact that the stuff you know there's no recorded history on these instruments is probably number one like you said because they weren't unique to to the Israelites or to our history, number one. And number two, because these musicians were so busy making music, they, but they didn't know how to write it down at that point. And if it's what? not written yeah. down, it gets lost. Okay, I, un I, I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, comments and answers, but my question still remains that why is there detail written down written down details on how to make certain things, the art and, and the uh, cubits. And, and I mean, all of these details given to one side of the coin and the other side of the coin, there are things made, there's no detail written. So my question, I, I hope that it's not getting, uh, you know, the question is, is I maybe I'm not asking it correctly, but, you are. but uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. you did. Uh, and this so, is there is a the statement will come. We will read it, okay, in a short while, as to why all the detail. Okay, it it and it's very specific, very specific. Uh, Pastor Bruce and then Amy. Just going back to the first. Um, well, not the first, but the first musical instrument reference in Genesis 4, because I think it's important to just hear mm -hmm. what this says at this point, Michael, because that's what you're really asking. Why isn't there tons of details in Genesis 4 when it says, Jubal, he was the pioneer of all who skillfully handle stringed instruments and wind instruments. That's the first mm -hmm. thing. No how to make the stringed instruments, not what to use for the stringed instruments, not the wood to use, not the strings to use. It just says that he was skillful at doing it, and that was it. And your question is, why isn't there details there? And the answer is, we don't know really why there's no details here. We don't know why. Why did they not find it important to put, you know, the wood and the, what do you make the string out of, and how many strings do there have to be on this one? And, you know, uh, it just says he was skillful at what he did. And, and and apparently that was enough at this particular point. <laughs> Otherwise, there'd be more details. It, but, it also um, depends on what level of information you're after. Yeah. Okay. If, if just it's to just to, to hear the good music, day. if you just to hear the good music, you don't have to get into all the details of... Uh, what notes are in the treble clef and you know and you know what they follow this and 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 you know bass and and all of that it, it just sounds good and and then there are other people especially music critics who will then go into certain details and then there are others who will look at it as the mood that that it evokes the musical piece evokes. And another person may emphasize some other area. So it, it, it's just a, um, it's, it, but you have to go down. Why, look, science does this all the time. Why, why do we talk about quantum mechanics? Okay, because we have been able to piecemeal things down to a very, very minute part, series of particles but it still has to be in relationship to everything else is what Mary is talking about. Yes, Amy, and then I'll come back to you, Michael. Okay. Well, it's occurred to me, and I don't know if this is the correct answer, Michael, but since musical instruments already existed, mm -hmm. details of making them may have already existed, 
and just didn't need to be rehashed. A good point, good point. The, the science of music, as Marty alluded to, is something that escapes uh, a majority of the people. Because if you look at uh, 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 music is a, uh, a form of art. And it is the only form of art that is heard. Everything else you see, you can get your hands on it. You sculpt and you paint and uh, all kinds of things you can do with, with your hand. Music is not that. It's something that is heard and it escapes people. It's not that easy. And so I believe that's where it really stems from because of, uh, of not really understanding. Pete, there are people out there that don't even like music. Not that many, but music is a very, very important part of society and every society, it's everywhere. Everywhere, every religion is just everywhere, but it's something that is not seen. And the, the instrument itself, it's made, so you make it and you hear it. That's why I believe there's no detail because people believe it's not important. As a matter of fact, how many times have I played piano at La Posada and every, every piano there needed tuning and the people in charge says, oh, they, you don't need a tune, they don't care. I hear it all the time. In recent years at the temple, it, they have been very, very good. When I talk to uh, the people in charge, uh, they have tuned the piano and I asked them, it was, it's wonderful. At the beginning, someone told me, well, what are you gonna do? What am I, I said, I'd like to get the piano tuned. And mm -hmm. Marty, it's 17 years ago, when Wanda Walensky, she had a, uh, a service, a Holocaust service. And I had just turned the temp, just joined the temple. And she asked me, Michael, would you, would you play the opening theme from Exodus? for my show, I said, absolutely. And so there are three and a half weeks before, this was a year before. And so three and a half weeks before that, that uh, service, the Holocaust service, I asked around and nobody would tune the piano. They wouldn't let me do it. As a matter of fact, one individual said, if I don't stop, they'll call the police on me for, stop, for harassing the temple. Okay. Right. Well, this so, points out the difference between the musician, each one of the craftsmen, each musician, exactly. each artist has to pay attention to the detail. Okay, the doctor, the lawyer, whatever, they have the details that pertain. But when people come, even if there's a semblance of, uh, of, of order it doesn't have to necessarily be exact because they enjoy the sounds that they heard but to the musician it is very critical to hear each tone the tonal qualities that are very important we would say this about a rabbi or a pastor the same thing. They go through the same thing in, in preparing their sermons. They, they have to take into lots of different things. So it's not unique, but yeah. putting it all together, it's the beautiful experience. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for pointing that very thing out. Because okay. these people that I talked to, they gave no consideration to me as the performer, as the scientist, as the doctor. That, yeah. that, you know, they would ask a, a surgeon, you know, to go in with a dull scalpel. Oh, it doesn't matter. It'll still cut, you know? <laughs> and so that's the point. They never gave any consideration to me as the performer that I would have to perform on something that's not acceptable. They don't know it. That's why I say this, escape, this escapes people. Sure. That's, that's where it's all right there, what you said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Bruce. I know it's almost 
time to uh, can i read the next verse because i think sure it'll help clarify maybe a little bit uh, of, of things mm -hmm. the next verse says you are also to make dishes pans jars and bowls to pour drink offerings from pure gold always set the bread of the presence on the table before me okay so there's tons of description for the ark tons of description for the cover of the ark there's going to be in the next paragraphs tons of descriptions for the menorah um dishes pans jars bowls not so much description not so much description there because like what somebody said earlier michael and i think this is true instruments were already there cups <laughs> bowls all those things were already they didn't need to have descriptions because they were already being used previous to this particular space of which we are reading right now why why there wasn't descriptions earlier of a specific cup or a specific bowl or a specific instrument or a specific we don't really know we don't really know but apparently it's because right now these are very specific instructions for something that's really important and some of these other things might not be quite as important as these things right here and that's how i kind of looked at that sounds good well if if it's okay uh michael you're gonna uh, i want to leave a little room for announcements uh, can uh, well, yeah very quickly sure very quickly in regards to the menorah uh you light you light the shamus and then the shamus lights the other candles now, is it important? No, 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 no. Michael, stop there. You're talking about the Hanukkiah that has eight right. plus one canes. We're talking about the, the menorah of seven canes. Okay, nothing to do with Shamash. I'm sorry. Yeah, this, it, it, it. What was, I don't get it. It's okay. I'll let okay, it the menorah, the, the, you have a Hanukkiah, which has an extra candle, the shamas. Okay, and that's, no, it, that's what you're referring to. But yeah. Mary was referring to the, the menorah, or which is a separate uh, holy object. Let me put it that way. Okay, okay. Which is coming up in our next paragraphs. That's but, right. But we're we'll not, we're be not discussing today, this next think. week. So and and bring if you need to bring it up again, Michael, next week we can do it. That's okay. 